Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello, I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and welcome to Benchmark. We'll explore a variety of issues involving our criminal justice system, our legal system, and how they intersect with the citizens of the town of Colony. Today, we're truly fortunate to be joined by one of New York State's premier attorneys involving driving while intoxicated cases. Peter Gerstenstang has been practicing law since 1970 and has a, a major focus on driving while intoxicated cases, both as a prosecutor here in the Albany County District Attorney's Office and also maintaining his own practice of law here in the Capital Region. And welcome, Peter, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, in looking over a variety of things uh, in your resume, too, I think it's truly outstanding, your background and experience. Of course, you graduated from Albany Law School uh, and then went uh, over to Vietnam soon after that. Right. And, um, and certainly got your first exposure uh, not only to the legal system and the military legal system, but also something that I did want to spend some time with you talking about today, which is something that I continue to talk about in my own um, management of the colony court system, which is addiction. And I think that um, your first exposure to the uh, evils of addiction uh, was uh, actually uh, while serving uh, in the uh, military. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, in 1971 in, uh, in Vietnam, we had a huge problem with heroin addiction. Uh, heroin was brought in by the Vietnamese in little green vials. It was very cheap. It was very pure. It wasn't injected. People snorted it like you see on television, people snorting co uh, cocaine. Um, but it was prevalent. Uh, at one point in time, they came in with a surprise urine analysis, and we had a battalion where over 50% of the members of that battalion came back positive for the presence of heroin. So it really jeopardized security, it jeopardized our function, it made everybody, made a very dangerous situation uh, a lot more dangerous. And we had all kinds of prosecutions for uh, sale and possession of heroin. You would go out on a bunker line uh, and find people who were nodding. Uh, one of the effects of heroin is uh, a nodding effect where the person looks like they're sleeping. Uh, it, it tends to cause your eyelids to droop and you'll see people nodding and like that. And that's a, a narcotic analgesic heroin. You can also see it uh, the after effects of anesthesia in hospitals. When you visit people in the hospital, you'll see that they appear to be asleep, but they'll talk to you and then their eyes droop closed. They're not sleeping. That's the after effect of a narcotic analgesic. That's the anesthesia, you know, uh, hopefully wearing off. Um, but yeah, it was a huge problem in, uh, in Vietnam. And there's no question that when you returned, uh, then you came uh, uh, affiliated with the Albany County District Attorney's Office in the early 70s. And uh, part of your duties, of course, was handling the town justice courts and uh, village justice courts here in the county. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. And yeah. is that your first exposure to the colony justice court? It was. It was. I came out as a young prosecutor. Uh, Judge D'Agostino was on the bench, Judge Tate. Uh, and that was a great advantage because uh, both of those judges were outstanding and I learned an awful lot from them, uh, both in law and philosophy. Uh, I remember Judge D'Agostino pronouncing a peace bond because these warring neighbors had, uh, could not come to any kind of, uh, of resolution. They were constantly in court and then Judge D'Agostino came up with a peace bond. And after everybody left, satisfied, and that was, by the way, the end of the dispute when, after Judge D'Agostino pronounced his peace bond, 
Uh, I asked him where in the law it was, and he informed me it hadn't been in the law for about 100 years, but he thought it would work out well in this case, and it did, <laughs> and it resolved, it resolved the, uh, the situation. But uh, those are good times. But a good chunk of what I was doing back then, uh, again, dealt with addiction, uh, although I didn't really initially appreciate that, but DWI cases. Exactly. And you know, it, it seems to me that uh, I, earlier this morning uh, I was um, uh, over at a high school uh, lecturing to a law class and telling uh, many of those students that one of the trends that I've noticed in the court system uh, now after nine years of serving as town justice is the, the impact of addictions on the court dockets and the court system and how oftentimes an addiction is underneath the alleged criminal activity, or the um, uh, or involved in the case in some ha in some way, and it seems to me that while you typically are involved in the defense of driving while intoxicated cases, you often recognize that the addiction underneath uh, may be a key element as to how uh, to manage a particular case in general. Oh, I think it's, it's absolutely critical. When you, when you have people who are repeat offenders, there is no question that you are dealing with the alcoholism or the drug addiction. Uh, and that's one place where the, the judge, the prosecutor, and the defense can really come together uh, and address a problem that the person themselves uh, either cannot or has, would not address until they were faced with the sanctions of the criminal justice system. That's the whole basis of the drug court program that Judge Kay uh, has implemented in New York, and it's a national program, and it's been tremendously effective because it brings the entire criminal justice system together uh, and has puts the person in a situation where they're directly accountable to a sitting judge. Uh, and that's worked out very well, but on a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of uh, defending DWIs, you, the two parts of it are one, all of the legal issues that go into a driving while intoxicated case, but the other is that you have to, as a defense attorney, you've got to address the problem. The problem is for the prosecutor and for the judge that if they agree to any resolution short of the most punitive resolution, and then that defendant goes out and kills somebody, they feel the, a, the sense of responsibility. If I had done A, B, C, maybe that person would be alive. It's, it's, totally, it's totally outside their ability to control the actions of another person. But that's the fear. And that's a legitimate fear and a legitimate concern. So the issue is for the defense to, uh, we're in the best position. I, a person who's accused of a crime can ignore their family. They can, uh, you know, give lip service to the court and to, uh, and obviously they have little communication with the district attorney. But when they put their lives in the hands of a lawyer that they're retaining and their freedom and everything is on the line, they can't ignore you. And when it's their lawyer that's telling them they have a problem, that they are an alcoholic or that they have an addiction and they have to address it, they can't evade you, they can't avoid you, and uh, they have to respond. So these arrests, this, this process that we have has done a huge amount to identify people who have, uh, who are alcoholics, who are drug addicts, um, and get them to confront the problem and deal with the problem and become abstinent. Uh, in the past, prior to this, this, you know, this doesn't just impact the you know, highway safety, it impacts domestic violence, it, perhaps, uh, it impacts job performance, it impacts human, human happiness. Just, the, the, you know, we have so many in this wonderful country in a, this time of all this opportunity, we have so many unhappy, miserable people and a good chunk of that misery and unhappiness deals and arises out of substance abuse. Well, it certainly had a dramatic impact on the uh, court system. Uh, in so many ways. Peter, you've seen, uh, over the course of time, you've seen the, the DWI laws change. It's a very large body of law now, and in some areas very complicated and very specific in many ways, too. Also, the, the level of intoxication has changed dramatically. I had Judge Phil Caponera as a guest here many months ago, and he told me that when he first became 
a town justice in the, uh, in, during the 70s that the uh, DWI threshold was 1.5 at that point, and I believe now, of course, it's 1, it's 08. So it has continued to be reduced by the state legislature. Have you seen a, a large change in how the state has managed um, alcohol-related cases? Oh, tremendous. It's been, uh, it has gone from the, when I first started as a prosecutor in the 70s to uh, being treated, it was a criminal offense, but it was not considered a serious crime. Now it is considered a very serious crime, and where it was once a very low priority of prosecutors, now it has become the top priority for, uh, or, or close to the top priority for most DA's offices. And you see offices uh, such as Nassau County uh, coming up with uh, really draconian uh, penalties and uh, punishments. Uh, Albany County has a very rigid policies in regard to DWI, and pretty much all of the counties, uh, Rensselaer, Saratoga, all of the counties in uh, the immediate area have taken very rigid, very tough positions, um, and I think that reflects society's attitude, because, you know, if you're talking about bank robbery, for example, which is a very serious crime, but if you don't want to be victimized by a bank robber, you don't have to work in a bank. If you don't want to be victimized by, uh, there's a lot of ways of avoiding, you know, be becoming a crime victim. How do you avoid being killed by a drunk driver? You have to drive. You have to be out on the highway. And consequently, all of us are potential victims. And the concept of drunk driving as a minor crime is long gone because they're all potential killers. And that's the fear of our of people that motivates the legislatures and our whole system to become tougher and tougher and tougher. They're trying to stop it. The methodology that they've used has not been particularly successful. And that's why you're seeing such, you know, exploration of alternative ways of dealing with it. Because the real issue is not, nobody decides to drive drunk, Judge. They decide to drink and drive. And the only real decision that they have is when they decide to drink and drive. That's the bad decision. Because once people start drinking, they lose control of their ability to make decisions. And so you'll see perfectly wonderful, nice, socially responsible people um, being arrested for drunk driving or a homicide. I watched 60 Minutes um, uh, the other day, and they had a sh uh, the show on about that horrible case in Nassau County where that little girl was killed in the limousine. Um, but they also showed the defendant, and the defendant before, the guy who did this, before the commission of this, had graduated from college, was a nice uh, kid with a good future, um, and had been drinking in a house, and what the, at least what they showed on television was, um, basically drank too much, he was drunk, they told him not to drive, and he got behind the wheel anyway. Now, does anybody think if this guy had started that evening out beforehand, uh, would have decided ahead of time to drink that much and get behind the wheel? Had he been in his right mind, he never would have gotten behind that wheel. But the problem is, when you have a situation of you're using a dangerous drug that distorts your dr judgment, eliminates your ability to make a choice, and you got a car outside. So the real issue is, is that if people are going to drink, you can't have the car. You can't have that as an option. And it's an interesting thing to see through the experience. I had a case uh, years ago where a guy had prior convictions. He was never going to drink and drive again. He wasn't going to stop drinking. So he goes out to a bar. He doesn't have his car. His girlfriend's going to pick him up. And he gets really drunk. He's had a great time. He, she comes and he pushes her into the passenger seat, drives the car, and gets arrested. And I mean, he'd set this whole thing up when he was sober, but what he didn't calculate is the fact that once he started drinking, he was going to lose all of that ability to make rational decisions. And that's one of the dividing lines, I think, between a person who's an alcoholic and a person who isn't, is that the person who's not an alcoholic still has control even though they've been drinking. 
And one of the, but just one of the characteristics of alcoholism, I think, is the loss of control once they start drinking. Um, and people think alcoholics are people who are, for example, uh, the guy who's drinking every day or he's got a, that's one kind of alcoholic. Alcoholics are actually like ice cream. There's different flavors. So people look at vanilla, and if I'm not vanilla, I'm not ice cream. But the truth is, there's vanilla, chocolate, strawberry. The most common alcoholic in DWIs is called the binge alcoholic. A binge alcoholic can go for 10 years, not have a drink, and not bother them. When they're not drinking, they're not bothered by alcohol or the lack of alcohol. But when they drink, they go out to have two beers. They have four, six, eight. Once they've had the two beers, they lose control. They drink far more than they plan. Since they only plan on having two beers, they figured they could drive a car safely. But now they've had eight, ten. They don't have any control over their drinking, and they no, don't have any control over their decision to get behind the wheel. And they wind up in your court. But well, the real decision was the, to drink and have the car in the first place. It's important to recognize and for all of us the correlation uh, between addiction and the criminal justice system and, um, and uh, it certainly uh, continues in that way. Uh, you've written uh, what many call the horn book of DWI law uh, back in 1987 was your first edition of handling the DWI case and uh, of course initially as a, a prosecutor here in Albany County uh, you worked with um, the state troopers in developing a framework or a format for prosecution of driving while intoxicated. Is that correct? Yes. And, um, and tell me how you got involved in that. Well, I, again, I came out of the Army right into the uh, Albany County DA's office. And Ira Mendelson, who used to be uh, the first assistant, uh, taught a class at the State Police Academy and needed somebody to fill in one day. And I went out for that one day and stayed for 12 years. Uh, and basically training troopers on how to testify in DWI cases. And the, about the time that the DA's association uh, asked our office to design a prosecution for the entire state. And so I went to work with the state police and we designed a prosecution uh, for DWI that's still being used with various modifications uh, for changes in the law today. And that was pretty exciting because I was working both with the state police. I worked did an awful lot with the colony police, and the colony police were very proactive, very interested in uh, evidence procedures. And it was just for a lawyer, it was about as good as it got because uh, you got to you know work with two great law enforcement agencies and with people who were really uh, motivated to, uh, and interested and doing these things. So uh, I was always out in the police cars. I was uh, constantly out either in the Colony Police car or the Loudonville uh, State Police. Uh, one night they were looking for me because there was a homicide and they were calling all over except for the fact their own cars and they finally figured out that I was actually out in a Colony Police car. Well, it was certainly during your days um, uh, in uh, serving our country in the military service and then also as a prosecutor that you became uh, so painfully aware of addiction and how it uh, negatively impacts a society. And you had a case early on as a prosecutor involving a bank robbery in the city of Albany, is that correct? Yeah, that was part of my education. Uh, I originally came into this with the DA's office with a very hard-nosed attitude that everybody should go to jail and that was the solution. Uh, despite the fact that what we've seen is jail's a revolving door, people come out and keep committing the same crimes and we put them in as addicts, they come out as addicts. Uh, the, the man who kind of got through to me was uh, with that was Judge uh, Patrick Maney from East Greenbush, who sat on a committee with me and had me go through a uh, the same program that uh, people convicted in his court were going through. I went through as an undercover defendant, and about that same time, I got involved in a bank robbery with um, uh, a uh, young man who went into the bank, having watched a lot of television, with his note saying, "Give me the money," and the teller declined to give him the money. And of course, he wasn't prepared for anything else because on television, they always got the money. Uh, so he really didn't know what to do. He discussed it with her and she said, well, I'm sorry, you know, I know, you know what the rules are, but I'm not giving you the money. And uh, so he didn't know what to do. So he went, went out and sat up and stood in front of the bank until the police came along and arrested him. He was trying to get the money for an addiction. And uh, typically he would have been uh, prosecuted and put in state prison. But at about that time, Father, uh, I'm trying to think of Mike's last name, but he ran Hospitality House. Uh, he was a Catholic priest who ran Hospitality House. 
And he did an awful lot of great work in this area. And he persuaded us to put this young man in hospitality house where they dealt with the addiction, they dealt with the problem. And we began to see, both the office and myself, what could be done uh, with people who were committing crimes uh, because of addiction. And Father Mike had a lot of success in straightening out people's lives. There's an awful lot of people who are walking around today leading normal lives uh, who are productive members of, of our society because of the intervention of Father Mike in the hospitality house. And I like that then, our, and our office. Uh, you know, there are people who belong in jail. There are people that really need to be jailed. The art for both the prosecution, the court, and the defense, well, mostly the court and the prosecution, is to discriminate between those people who need to be in jail and those people who need to be required to confront their alcoholism and their drug addiction by using the threat of jail. Now, routinely today, in the, in the handling of a, a DWI uh, case or an, another alcohol-related case, the court often uh, requires attendance uh, by the defendant to the victim impact panel. What's your take on how that's working and uh, whether that's had a positive impact on how uh, these cases have, are being handled? I think it generally, I think it's had a very good thing. It really depends on the individual uh, victim impact panel and it depends on the orientation of the defendant in the first instance because people have to realize that you know, be, just because you, you didn't uh, wind up in a fatal accident uh, doesn't mean that you didn't run that risk. When you drive drunk, you run the risk of killing or injuring. What the victim impact panel does is it gives you the, the tragedy. It gives you the sense of the people uh, who either experienced the being the crippling effect of being uh, hit by a drunk driver or the families that have lost uh, their sons and daughters, husbands and wives to uh, a drunk driver. So it's an intensely emotional experience. I recommend that I think one of the things that we do wrong is victim impact panels right now are pretty much relegated to people who are sent there by judges who have been convicted of DWI and DWAI. Everybody should attend a victim impact panel. Uh, this should be mandatory for every high school. It should be mandatory uh, for every parent. You want to take your kids to a victim impact panel. Why are we waiting for people to, you know, drive? Why don't we get people, let them see and hear from the folks who have suffered this. If we can raise consciousness, if we can save some lives, um, you know, it's not what people know that affect their behavior. If, uh, if, if knowledge was as effective as we think it is, there'd be no smokers, there'd be no overweight people, uh, you know, there wouldn't be. Knowledge doesn't do it. But what people feel controls, it's what we want, what we feel controls our behavior. Uh, the nice thing about, and the good thing about victim impact panels is they're about feeling. They're about human emotion. They are about things that all of us can understand. The tragedy of loss, we can understand. The, uh, uh, the pain and being crippled, we can understand. So I've spoken at victim impact panels. I've attended victim impact panels. I've taken uh, my children to victim impact panels. Um, again, they will vary depending on how they're set up and who's speaking that particular night. But I think that's, that's something that really should be a lot more widespread than it really is. Well, it's a very uh, dynamic point. And looking at the changes in the DWI laws uh, over the years, it seems to me that often uh, the, the modifications have uh, been driven by uh, victims. And the state legislature has attempted to address uh, the call by victims as to how these laws could be modified and tightened and, um, and amended in order to uh, better handle the situation. Do you agree that it's uh, often victim-driven in this case or in New York State? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And if you, if you think about it, um, you lose a child in a war. It's a tragedy, but it is one that you can put within a kind of a framework, just as if you lose a loved one to a disease. There's a kind of a framework. There's an understanding. Uh, there is a meaning there. But to lose somebody in a drunk driving collision 
it is totally devastating because it is so random, it is so meaningless, and consequently the first focus of people who have suffered this tragedy is to focus first on the defendant. They want, you want to hate that defendant, that defendant is a killer, that defendant is this evil person, but you're stuck with the fact that most people uh, convicted of vehicular homicides are normal, mundane, average people who are distinguished only by the fact that they drank too much on that particular occasion and they drove into and killed your loved one. Uh, you, we like to think that they're the ones who are the repeat drunk drivers, but I remember having, you know, like four homicides in a year and with one being a 60-year-old grandmother uh, with no prior record, uh, another being uh, the world's greatest babysitter, this teenage girl. The whole town turned out for this teenage uh, girl in support of her. She killed uh, a couple of her friends in an uh, accident. She was devastated. She, they were in a car, you know. But she was a person who was well-known in the small town, well-loved. Uh, she uh, wound up doing uh, one to three in state prison. Uh, but how do you hate this, you know, this teenage girl. Uh, another one was a uh, businessman, a father of a couple of kids, and then was a single mom. I mean, I look back over all the vehicular homicides we've handled, and there was nobody that, you know, people could really hate. So you're sitting there with this horrible situation, this horrible loss. How do you get meaning out of it? And you get meaning out of it through joining organizations such as MAD, SAD, RID, all of these organizations provide a way to do something that will give meaning to this loss by preventing this from happening uh, to others. And that's what drives this, this desire for meaning, to make something meaningful come out of it. And that's a very potent force. And the effect of that has been to revolutionize the legislation in regard to DWI uh, which is, there is no other area of the law that comes close, maybe domestic violence, but there's no other area of the law that's gotten this kind of a focus. And in point of fact, it's gotten to the point where we really strain the bonds of the Constitution in DWI and our efforts to, uh, you know, get, to stop the, the uh, body count, um, we have really strained the Constitution. No other area of the law do you see situations such as well, we're going to presume you're innocent, but we're taking your license as soon as you walk into court, even though nobody's made any finding of guilt. No other area of the law. We're going to seize your car in New York City. Laws NASA, we're taking your car and you can't have it back, even though we're presuming you innocent. Uh, and we have had no hearing, no uh, process, no nothing. I mean, that would be unheard of in any other uh, field of, uh, of, of, you know, criminal law in terms of the presumption of innocence. Bail. We recently had the most startling thing. It was a, a homicide in Rensselaer County, a tragedy. This young boy is killed, the driver of the car, the passenger is killed, and this driver is accused of the homicide. And he's in, uh, in Rensselaer County Court in front of Judge uh, Jay Con. And the, it's a kid, he's no, no priors, he lives in the area, he's with his parents. The judge puts all of these conditions on his release. He's got to be at home, he's got to be in treatment, he's got to be doing all these things. I, I think he even had a monitor on him. I mean, really very stringent conditions, but he didn't set a monetary bail. And people went crazy because the judge had released somebody uh, on a vehicular homicide without setting a monetary bail bail. And they wanted a bail to reflect the loss. The problem is, is the bail is to make sure that the person comes back. You only set bail as a judge if the, to ensure that the person is going to show up for court. So if you've got somebody who's dependent on their parents, lives in the area, has got no prior record, typically you wouldn't be setting uh, a bail. And in this case, Judge Jacon had set all of these other very stringent conditions. And this kid couldn't and go any place, in fact, didn't. But the political heat the, 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 that was generated because of that actually had the Rensselaer County Legislature debating uh, and passing a resolution calling on the New York State Legislature to pass a law that in vehicular homicides we're going to have a mandatory bail without any consideration as to whether this person is going any place. The law would have been unconstitutional 
had the legislature considered it, the Rensselaer County legislature surely knew that what they were saying was legally ridiculous and totally unconstitutional, and yet, because of political pressures, they did that. That's the only scary part. The law should be sacrosanct. The law, the Constitution should be upheld, and regardless of, you know, the passions of the moment, we cannot sacrifice those constitutional protections. Because if you don't protect the people that you hate and fear the most, then none of us have any protection. Peter, the state legislature, uh, as we've noted, has uh, made a variety of uh, changes to uh, laws involving DWI. Most recently, of course, they've even created a new class of DWI, aggravated driving while intoxicated, which has added just uh, yet again a new element uh, to the prosecution and defense as well. Are there any particular changes you would advocate for in connection with state legislation in order to um, uh, um, better the DWI laws in the state of New York? Any modifications you would recommend? Well, I think they kind of preempted what I would have recommended by doing it, which they are now focusing more and more on evaluation and treatment. They're mandating uh, the treatment. There's a much greater focus, and this is something I was saying for years is let's attack the problem, let's solve the problem and, and stop putting band-aids on it. Uh, let's get people into treatment. Let's use the criminal justice system to accomplish that. I think the drug court program, you see a, you know, if you go out and you see, oh, Schenectady, Montgomery, Albany, all the counties have them. <clears throat> I've seen, uh, I've watched Judge uh, Katina's drug court out in Montgomery uh, County. I think that is one of the most effective programs going. In fact, they were, they were so, apparently the people who graduated were so enthusiastic, they formed some alumni organization that's doing their own outreach. Um, Judge Giardino's over in Fulton County is another example of where people, nobody likes drunk drivers particularly people who've been convicted of drunk driving. Nobody approves of, of this. This is not, it's not like there's a, a club. And people who have these problems, who drink and drive, or who've been arrested, who have an alcohol problem, get into these programs and they have the intervention of a sitting judge, a district, the district attorney, and a treatment team. This has proven to be one of the most effective things going in terms of their rate of success and the, the very low rate of uh, people relapsing. Uh, people leave these programs and basically get a new lease on life. Uh, they remain in AA, they uh, remain abstinent. And drug court, I think, uh, I, they, I don't know if it's legislatively mandated or it was mandated by the Office of Court Administration. I know Judge Kay really did a great deal of That's getting true. people. But I think the biggest change I would make, every court in the state should be a drug court. Every town, village, uh, county court, we now have, we're so, starting to see that happen where it was just county courts before. Correct. Now we're seeing uh, some city courts. Uh, but I think every town, village, and court uh, should be mandated to conduct a drug court. I think we would do a world of good there. Well, Peter uh, Gertzenzang, you're so nice to join us today. You're practicing law here in the capital region and um, uh, primarily focusing on the handling of driving while intoxicated cases. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, family? Um, and and uh, your wife joins you in your practice? My wife practices with us, my daughter Erin, and I've got uh, two other uh, kids in law school. Um, you know, and uh, we love it. I really, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful practice. Uh, you get to fight cases in court, and yet you get to make an impact on people's lives in terms of getting people into treatment. It's a very rewarding practice. Well, your view and understanding uh, globally about what's underneath uh, so many of the cases that are involved in the court system, uh, which is clearly tied to addiction, uh, based on the volume that um, I'll handle 8,000 cases a year here in Colony, A, and I can uh, sense that uh, addiction is underneath so many types of cases, not just driving while intoxicated cases, but a variety of cases uh, where there's an addiction underneath, which causes and generates uh, a visit into the criminal justice system. And thank you for joining us today. It was certainly our pleasure. Well, thanks for having and me. We Judge. hope you'll join us again soon.
I'm Judge Peter Crummy, and thank you for joining me on Benchmark.